Um, so we talked about writing cat categories of writing technologies. That's always fun. Um, and I do have uh, videos online if you guys need refreshing. You can um, go on to my YouTube channel and I'll try and post them to Canvas as well if you're still feeling kind of stuck. You can also go back to the People's Reading or the Gabrielle Reading. And some of those things from the People's Reading we're going to highlight as well. Um, okay. So we talked about some of the components. Um, we mentioned a little bit um, that with the technological, we have to tie back to the scientific um, when we discussed um, how we deal with memory. So the brain acts almost like an archival technology this way in the fact that it stores information. And it's got a, it's a, a um, yeah, that we use it to hang on to text. Those texts for our brain usually are oriented around specific memory storage. And so, um, that's why when we, went, when we saw the video from uh, Crash Course and it talked about making things memorable, making things stick, well, um, our brain hangs on to a lot of things, but uh, if we want to make it its own, um, if we want to make it something worth retrieving for our brain or for our brain to know that that's it, something we want to hang on to, that it's not just a free write or a randomly scribbled grocery list or something, we have to make it more memorable. So we have to know how to engage with our brain as a writing technology so that it stores information we want to. And so, there's, so we, it's important to start there when we think about writing technologies in dealing with um, the role writing into our brain or onto a computer or onto a paper, or however it is, uh, acts to store information. Um, when we get to encoding and decoding, um, we have to make that distinction between um, the linguistic encoding and decoding, where we talk about specific language, and that, and um, and we get beyond that and say um, how we use non non language oriented techniques to get people to take in information. Um, so that's where we just did we get all the way to readability and literacy. I feel like I'm not sure if we covered this. So we did talk about it a little bit, um, but essentially readability and literacy in some conversations will sound, will both refer to reading comprehension, um, but we, we need to make a distinction between traditional linguistic literacy, which is how the brain decodes words and context and um, kind of when we discuss things like semantics and that sort of thing, how we know what the meaning is um, versus when uh, technological readability, which is how fast our brain can take in information. Um, so uh, they actually use, uh, there are now programs for scanning resumes. Um, there are computer programs for scanning re resumes for key information for keywords. And so this concept of readability um, is not just something that humans have to be aware of, but also um, that we've developed software to do for us a little bit to make sure that the kind of uh, the, in, in the case of resumes, to make it clear in that initial look that the person submitting a resume has stated key keywords or key qualifications. Um, so this idea of readability is how we can look at a document, take in information quickly, um, based not on the words necessarily, but how they're formatted. So if there are bullet points, if there are indents, if there are spaces between words, um, that's what that uh, people's reading discussed. When it, who here found that an interesting thing when you're looking at the words? Anybody try and read it out loud? That section in that reading? Yeah? A couple of yeah, it was it was easier with the spaces. Yeah. No, yeah. or it wasn't. It was easier to read out loud when there was no spaces. Okay, good. Um, so we've got so we want to make a distinction between readability and literacy, um, especially when we um, are talking technological readability, not reading comprehension. Reading comprehension has to do with language or literacy. Technological readability has to do with the things around the language that signal that tell us how to break up information so that our so that our brains. So that our brain can upload the information faster as a result of non-linguistic or language-oriented cues. Um, there are a bunch of things with document design. This is where we stop. Yeah. So um, this idea of readability relies heavily on um, visual design or document design. Um, the more practical side of this design, um, not the aesthetic side, um, not just trying to make something fun, um, but how do we present information in a way that people can understand it. So the more practical side of design for encoding information and facilitating decoding information. Uh, visual design, we said, is of course aesthetic and rhetorical and structural. So when we talk about visual design, we can analyze a writer's choices regarding visual design on each of these planes or dimensions and each of these lenses. Um, so it's important to know which lens we're trying to think about visual design with. The same way when we talk about technologies or any particular thing we're dealing with, 
what's the lens we're, we're trying to use? Um, so, you know, for our class, we're looking at um, specifically a writing technology. So we want to not just look at the technology and how it impacts society generally, because that's more of an anthropological thing. We want to say, as a writing technology, how does it affect communication? And for our project, we're also using a rhetorical lens. Um, and so with that, we want to look at those specific rhetorical components, audience, purpose, topic, scope, stance, exigency, um, and those sorts of things. Um, and when we say audience, we don't just mean generally. We, we could do stakeholder mapping. We could tie to primary, secondary, collateral audiences, and some of those other things we've discussed. Um, so we want to know, as we look at something, we want to know what lens. So in visual design, technologically, it's the lens of how am I strategically designing this text so that people can stick the information into their brain faster. Not are they enjoying it, not is it pretty, not does it help point to or convince someone of something or um, enforce my rhetorical purpose, um, but how do I make it so the reader can take it into, my, into their brains. Um, we don't, we're not using the Norton Field Guide, but sometimes I do, so I've got that link down there. Um, we can use, if we go to this usability.gov, the what and the why on visual design, um, I think I mentioned when we talked about it in the rhetor rhetorical, that with visual design, um, one of the challenges um, is that when you go looking for resources on it, you get the mashup of its roles. So a lot of times, so even this source I have, it's got a list of the components, but it ties in, in on that page, it ties in aesthetic values, it ties in um, rhetorical values, and it ties in technological values all at once. But there's a list of 20 or 30, which we may uh, dig into here in a little bit. Um, but let's, let's just practice this a little bit. And so some of you already have, when you, if you looked at that uh, section from Peoples, so I'm just gonna highlight part of that reading from the Peoples article um, from 2003. Take a moment and try and read this in your head. Take about a minute. Where are you at? Tell me where you're at. Line. What line? Third line. If you're on the second line, raise your hand. If you're on the third line, raise your hand. If you're on the fourth line, raise your hand. If you're on the fifth line, raise your hand. Sixth? Nobody got past the fourth. I finished. I got to almost to the end, like the last line. Okay. Okay, so a couple. Good. Um, was that hard? Yeah. What's the passage about? <laughs> Okay, uh, let's try, so we'll talk a little bit about some of the topogra typography. I always get topography and typography mixed up. Topography is mapping oriented. Let's not confuse ourselves. Now read this one. Wave at me when you're done. Like half the class is not even looking at the screen. You're just like, I just read that. I'm not doing it. I get it. Um, <laughs> the other half of the class is like, yeah. Um, okay, maybe not. But uh, when we look at this, like, obviously, theoretically, obviously, when I ask the question, which one's easier to read? Top one or the bottom? The bottom. That is why they created spaces between words in the first place. But that was not always how they wrote. That is not always how we were trained to write. Um, now, what is it, what else about this text is different than we might see on a daily on a usual daily basis? 
All caps. Anything else? No periods. What did you say, Michael? It would, because there's no punctuation, it feels like a run-on. But punctuate, it's only a run-on if you're using punctuation, if, if the comma has been invented. Right? So if you go back and read a 14th century piece of writing and there's no commas, you're like, OK, maybe it's because they didn't have them yet. I can't remember exactly when the comma came into English, so I should look that up. But yeah, like, think, of, think about the people um, who, were in, who were grading your papers in seventh, eighth grade with all the marks about punctuation. And look at this and go, those guys had it easy, right? Um, all they had to do was include spaces between their words. Come on. Um, all right. So, so when we talk about this idea of readability, we could look at um, we could look at a variety of things. It de it deals with that. How do we use space? That's one thing we'll look at. The other thing uh, that can be interesting. Um, I'm going to put this on the board, but. Um, the all caps is actually, um, so they've done, um, they've used what's called eye tracking software to study how fast someone works through um, texts like these to figure out like what is the, what's the most effective uh, typography and font style um, and that sort of thing. And one thing that they said is when reading all caps is actually harder to read. It's harder to read, you don't read as fast when you read all caps. Why would that be? Because we're trained. Okay. Everything's important or ask someone's yelling at me, so now I have an emotional connection to what's happening. <laughs> so why are you yelling at me about Victor Hugo's novel? Um, <laughs> okay, fine. Um, yeah. <laughs> can't um, see. This is like my personal opinion, but when sentences have structure and like periods and stuff, it creates this kind of flow in what you're reading. So it, it well, me at least, I read things really smooth when sentences are structured very well and have So this, this idea, when you say flow, so one, in writing, flow is an interesting like omnibus term, which means people use it for all kinds of things. Uh, this idea of flow, like does it, I hear, if when I was in the writing center, and um, I still, even when I'm just talking with students, I, students are like, just help, I wanna figure out why it's not, why my essay's not flowing right. Um, well, it's like, well, you're not Eminem, so you know, there's not a beat, put a beat to it. Yeah, that's it. That's a different kind of flow. So, that, but in writing, it becomes this kind of interesting, like gray area. Something counts. Like when we think about if our, is our essay flowing, it could be connected to like the analytical aspect of writing and the logic and sequence of the, the ideas. Um, do the ideas make sense? It could be structural. Does the point A to point B to point C does that um, does that structure or sequencing or organization make sense? Or it could be at a sentence or word level. Am I seeing words in a structure I'm used to seeing them? That adds a certain flow to it. It means that I can digest it quickly. It's interesting to use the concept of flow in connection to punctuation because, and so uh, you're actually. I just, I just you're, feel like this has like absolutely no structure, so there's no way that it can flow, which would make it hard. So, what, me, so I, that's why I said this was yeah, my first. No, no, no. And I'm, like, I'm, I'm calling yeah. you, I'm not like challenging. I'm, you, the fact that you notice this and you're using that word is, is important uh, because you're processing through something we need to talk about. If we read this, everybody take a deep breath and try and read it out loud. I think Victor Hugo's no. <laughs> I'm not going to be the only one doing that. Okay. On the count of three, all right? Same time, man, same time. <laughs> all right. One, two, three. Who knew where to breathe? Don't breathe. Who here was ever told punctuate when you breathe? Like you, something like that. Like yeah. punctuation should happen. It's a way of resting from breath. So there's, if you're thinking organically about punctuation, that's not a terrible. That's not a terrible rule, um, it, it, or a, a guideline. It that's a that's a form of effective punctuation. 
but if you're trying to adhere to specific sociocultural norms, um, that th the punctuation, um, that doesn't work to punctuate based on sociocultural norms. But it's a good rule of thumb to help break up the writing for your reader. Yes, Ashley? I feel like maybe the reason it's so much easier to read, like when there's the spacing and when there's punctuation and kind of the inflection that having that structure gives, then it maybe it codes differently into our minds because it codes more like a spoken language. With the punctuation? Yes, because I feel like, especially, uh, you kind of see more frequently a lot with social media um, and like text speak. Uh, as this generation has kind of formed a new way to write that wouldn't technically be considered um, like grammarly sound, but it linguistically, um, we all understand what it means because it kind of communicates in a way that's more similar to actual conversation. Okay. So maybe it's kind of like those were the first steps towards that. Okay. Yeah, and I mean, we're, we're dealing with how languages get generated. This is at the early stages of how the written language of English is being processed and generated. Um, when we're talking about text speak, we're in the early stages of how text speak is being generated. And users of that language are better at understanding or decoding that language. People who don't use that language and are used to a different sociocultural norm or a, complete or a different language, um, they don't. And so yeah, you're, you're tying in really, con you're connecting this in a nice way, good job. Um, so yeah. Um, with, when we think about the way we process language, there's, um, so not only do those, not only is it that we need to be used to it in the first place, um, it, it needs to be a language we use or the way we speak, um, but sometimes just in written form, even if you're really, even if you're a really effective oral communicator, in written form, there are certain cues you have to give your reader that you don't have to give a speaker or don't have to give a listener. Um, we use a lot of body language to indicate uh, or to signal things when we communicate. Um, I mean, I'm really, I'm really, I gesticulate wildly sometimes. But um, you know, you, if you've seen in movies or uh, maybe you've just seen me talk um, and do this, but when someone's trying to talk sequencing or talk through something and there's multiple points. Like sometimes they'll do finger one, finger two, finger three, like that. Like I got three points. Like there's that, and then there's that, and then there's that. Does that make sense? Okay. And then, um, uh, and then other times maybe they'll do like they'll do this thing from top to bottom, like indicate some sort of level sequentially with this physical motion. So if you're listening, you have no idea, and this is my point exactly. Um, just thinking about it, thinking out loud. Um, but we don't have to signal certain things. Now the whole class is creeped out because I show you how um, we don't have to think about those things in person with people. We don't have to think about things like punctuation because the person pauses, because the person uses other, other ways, nonverbal forms of communication, non-language oriented forms of communication. So when we're talking about this um, in speech form, our body language becomes that other system. In written form, um, the punctuation is supposed to indicate things like breath or indicate that body language in essence. There are ways of signaling um, other, the, how we're structuring something. So um, there's another component to this that helps us process the text when we use it with punctuation. And if there's punctuation, it, they, those pieces of punctuation act as download points for our brain. So um, when we use commas, that helps us structure the information. Um, we, we learned yesterday, or the guy mentioned yesterday when he was talking about in that video um, about archival technologies, he talked about um, how when we shifted to, to the book codex from, um, from the scroll, it was a way of uh, kind of essentially breaking it up into packets, which is also how computer programs send things over the web because it's easier to send small bits, right? Well, our brain functions like that with language and punctuation does that job. When we look at a big chunk like this, it's a little overwhelming, right? Did you, would you agree this was a little overwhelming, especially that top section? Like looking at that and going, I have to read that? Who freaked out a little? Who threw up in their mouth a little? 
That's gross. I'm just joking. <laughs> like suddenly all the anxiety. That's gross. I'm really sorry about that one. That's terrible. Um, but when we use punctuation, when we use commas, periods, semicolons, colons, uh, dashes, hyphens, quotation marks, these things break up a text in the same way someone's breath or someone bo someone's body language does, but it also indicates to our brain download points. So every period says you can, you can pause for a second and stick that in your brain. Every end of a paragraph is a download point to say you can take a minute, take a second, download. We've finished that. One of the challenges, one of the reasons people struggle reading long paragraphs or sometimes academic writing that has a page and a half long paragraph or some sort of really complex thinking uh, is because the packet is too huge to, for your brain to digest. That's why when we talk about like reading in the triple pass method, um, that's encouraged because it helps your brain start to build that so the packet seems smaller. You know what to expect on how big that information is going to go in your brain. You guys tracking with this? There's a reason a lot of this feels where there's a reason I'm connecting a lot of this technological to the brain. This is uh, this is one of the big focuses for the technological aspect of writing is when we talk about that readability, it's how our brain digests that information. So if it sounds like I'm being repetitive, it's because I am, and it's because that's how that's a thing that readers don't that writers don't always think about. That the reason I'm writing it this way, that the reason I use punctuation this way, that the reason I paragraph this way, it is about making meaningful chunks, and it's about making sure my reader doesn't get exhausted as they read. And it's making sure that my reader can actually take in the information. Um, who here has ever read something and fell asleep while reading? Okay, you done that thing like you lay on the couch, you get it, you lay it out, the textbook or whatever's out in front of you, and you last five minutes. Yeah, you feel me? Um, anybody, anybody counter that and try and like set it up on a, set it up on top of a table or a counter and stand while you read? Anybody yeah, use that technique? Um, there was a, I read a, I can't even remember him, I think the guy's name was John Rush, but uh, in a, there was a book about a politician who was like a vice president or head of a secretary, like head of, it was like one of the president's secondhand guys. And he, one of the ways he got through college while working is it talks about him staying up till two in the morning, leaning against a wall and reading because you're less likely to, you know, drop and fall asleep standing up because your heart rate's automatically up a little higher than when you lay down. So it's kind of interesting stuff. But all of this has to do with how, when we think about our reader, how are they going to read it? Are we, are we writing in a way that they're going to be able to process the information? Um, to borrow a little bit from second language writing stuff that I, and multilingual studies, um, when people are speaking to uh, listeners of other languages um, where it's not their primary language, uh, it's they say it's not as important how fast you speak, it's important that you incorporate pauses. It's the same, it's the same principle, it's your brain's ability to digest a chunk of language at a time. And so you can talk really fast, but if you include pauses that gives the brain a chance to digest the sentence, the paragraph, whatever it was. If you just keep talking fast or slow, there's never a download point, and it's like your brain starts fraying and getting lost. Make sense a little bit. Okay. Sorry that I don't have more slides to talk through this. I probably should revamp this. All right. So that's readability. Let's um, let's talk about this. Um, I, actually, I want you to discuss this in your at your tables. So um, I'll give a I'll give a little bit of an overview, and then I'm gonna let, and then I want you guys to think about it. Um, another component often connected to the technological aspect of writing is this uh, this component accessibility. Um, now, when you guys think accessibility. Um, Maybe you think, what do you think? What do you think? What's the first thing you think? Actually, I'm gonna mute this for a second. Say it again. Easy to get to. It's easy to get to, okay. Like something's easy to get to, okay? Okay, when, um, when we think about accessibility as like a political issue, um, when does it show up? If you can't hear from them, you said? If you like, can't hear from them, hear like, like no, do you like, I don't know, hear what they want to, like the platform they're saying. Okay, know. so you, you can't hear them? If you don't, yeah, like if you don't know about them. Yeah. Okay, like you, you just don't have access to who they are as a, at all? You, okay, you don't even know they're running or what their platform is, okay? It's like if you reach out to them and they don't even make an effort to like try to say something back. Okay. 
Do what? Politicians or politics? I said politics, like as a political issue, I think is what I said. Um, but maybe it's uh, as a social issue, maybe uh, accessibility when you go to the grocery store, what do you think of? Birds that's in the price range. Say again? Is it, your if budget. it's in your price range, yeah. your budget, okay. What else, what else might link to accessibility? Cool. Um, what's the opposite of accessibility? Long lines. Maybe. If you what, if you can't access something, you don't have the ability to access something. What's the so what's the inverse of this? So it's usually disability. Accessibility, disability. Um, so when we talk about accessibility. Uh, technologically, um, there are a couple levels we can think about it at, but this links to conversations for handicapped spaces. This links to conversations connected to those little, uh, the, the rolly carts um, that, um, the motorized carts that they have at the front of the grocery store, the ramps, um, the, the bumpy yellow um, sidewalks that indicate to a blind person um, that a major traffic point is coming. Um, so this ties to that a little bit. So when we talk about, as writers, that concept, um, we want to say first something is most accessible if it's easy to approach, reach, enter, speak with, or use. So that's kind of where Adrian was going. Um, and then we can look at it from a couple different levels. The physical, our physical ability to use something, our technical skills or knowledge, and sociocultural access. Um, and there's actually, if you want further research or reading, if you decide this is something cool, you can go back into the slides um, and use this, uh, follow the special issue on accessibility or disability through Composition Forum um, from a couple years ago. Um, but go ahead and pause, um, or I'll pause, in your groups, discuss when some form of accessibility shows up in connection to writing. So someone's physical ability to write using your technology you're thinking about, someone's technical skill, how much technical skill do they need to write or to communicate with that thing or to receive communication, how much sociocultural access, economic, educational, think ideological apparatuses from Althusser that we talked about. Discuss that in your groups at your tables. Do that for two or three minutes and then we'll share out. Listening, you want me to skip ahead.
So you can't, so, so see, you don't have access to proper education on how to use the technologies? Yes. So like, I, I never learned how to write with a pencil, that kind of stuff, because yeah. pencils were too expensive. Possibly. But more likely to be, in, in at least in, in US culture, more likely to be like computers, right? Yeah, more okay. so like the technology that's available. The modern technology, the yeah. electronic or electrical, yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, let's do Joe and then Trevor. Technical skill, like older people don't really know how to use like smartphones and stuff like that. So One that's ageist. <laughs> <laughs> it is a at least a stereotype that old people don't. That, that, so, but let's let's not. We've got to be careful painting with broad strokes. But I know what you mean. So if you're older and you haven't had and you didn't grow up with that technology, maybe it was harder to struggle, or maybe it was a more of a struggle for you to learn a new technology. Um, there is the saying, "Old dogs, new tricks." That whole thing, right? So I'm trying to get with where you're going. You have to be careful how you say it because someone's going to challenge you on ageism. But yes, yeah, because old, dog, old dogs can learn new tricks. Yeah, uh, but yeah, sorry, not to. Good job, Joe. Do you say cheese its and rice? Are you hungry? <laughs> Joe, you make a good point. I'm just going to be there. Um, yeah, uh, Trevor. It's like when I have the technical skill to use like PowerPoint or Word, they were never taught how to do it. Okay. Technical skill, mm -hmm. cool. Uh, Adrian's like me, me, me. Oh, we just talked about kind of how like someone with a like a physical disability, like maybe visually, like they're visually impaired, uh, they might not have as good of a grip on like the physical, like uh, like the physical practice of like writing, like physically, but uh, they could still have like the con like good content in their mind. Okay, so you're saying um, some. So the thing you're saying is like, if someone can't see, then it's harder for them. They it, they might have good ideas, but they struggle writing them out if they're supposed to do them with their hand, um, because they might not be able to know. Like if you're using a pencil, for instance, we learn um, often we're trained by those like dotted line papers. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Okay, so you like penmanship. It's harder to write that way. Okay, I'm tracking. Uh, which is why we why Braille was invented, right? Okay, uh, let's go Michael and then Callie and then Jared. Uh, maybe writing about um, something if you understand the subject enough. Um, just the subject is to like a higher level. Okay, so kind of dealing with the content of the subject or background knowledge on the subject? The content. Okay. That is a form of accessibility. Um, it's not... Would that be considered? I don't know that people would consider it technological accessibility, um, but it absolutely, yeah, okay. So it, it absolutely is a form of accessibility. If you don't have background knowledge, you have to be able to go find that knowledge. So yeah, uh, so we could call it sociocultural. Yeah, good. 
Um, Callie. Um, under physical, if I'm not able to speak, I can't use things like Siri. Under technical, it'd probably be like, um, like for my project, I'm doing a typewriter. If you don't know how to use the typewriter properly, it's not going to work for you. Yeah. Yep. And uh, Gracie, I'm sorry if she swept the leg over there. I hope you're okay. Like, <laughs> uh, that's a good point. <laughs> like, what just happened? Um, yeah, if you don't know how to use a QWERTY keyboard, um, or you have to use the hunt and tech method or something, like uh, like I hunt for the keys, not tech. Uh, the, the individual key as opposed to like the like all that fun practice. Okay, uh, Jared? I guess under socio-cultural, like Google Docs is free, and Microsoft Word, if you're not a student, you gotta pay for it. Yeah. So maybe Google Docs is more accessible. Broadly, yes, absolutely. Gina? This is what I said, but um, going based off what Nadia said, um, you do have to, well, on my laptop, every time I go to grade papers, it'll bring up like a box saying, oh, you have to pay for Microsoft Word, and mm -hmm. I'm like, no. So that's why I always <laughs> use Google Docs because of that accessibility. So you're opening the, the, the documents from Canvas it, that are text documents, you're opening them in Google Docs instead of Microsoft Word. So what category of accessibility is that tied to? Because um, you're right that that's a true statement, what you said. How does that connect to this? Well, I'm just really looking at the, the definition for accessible. Oh, OK, like that easy to approach. OK, I'm tracking. OK, so that's like like some, OK, so you can stand. You're good. That's an interesting, so that's closer to like rhetorical accessibility, like how do I engage my audience so that they'll hear the ideas? Um, so that's all what rhetoric is about, is how do I deal with audiences? And when we get to uh, the Rogerian model, hopefully tomorrow, um, and some of the other structures, uh, we'll talk about like, what are some strategies that we can try and get into or access um, someone else um, at a level that they'll listen? So that's really important. That's more rhetorical accessibility, and I've never thought of it in that language before, so thank you. I've thought of those concepts, but not put them together. Good job. Um, Ashley, and then Seth, and then Jacob, and then Casey. So for the physical ability, you may have access um, to, say, like community centers if you don't have your own tools, but if you don't have a way to get to that community center to use those tools, then they're not accessible. If the public, if, if you have access to the public library, but it's eight miles away, and it's 110 out, you probably don't want to make that eight mile trek. You might just decide to stay home. Depends on how much you care about the resources available. Um, so who did I say was next? Seth, yeah. and then Jacob, and then Casey, and then Alexi. I guess pertaining to economic access, I think that kind of has to deal with everything. So if you if you're more fortunate or have more money, you on average have opportunity to go to better schools to get better education to get better technology in order to be successful and to find all those other skills that you need based off of that access. Okay. Uh, I was going to talk about socio-cultural access of um, basically like dif different outlets of information that we have nowadays. Uh, economically, uh, you only really need maybe like a simple phone. I mean, most people don't think so, but like a lot of people have smartphones even if they are cool, just because, I mean, it didn't used to be like that, but now it is, just because it's, everyone just has one, even if it is six years older. Um, educational access, you can basically learn everything you learn in school, including basics or higher ups. Online, you could go to a library, you could get a library membership. You could pay to be on a computer, you could be at a friends or family house. It's just, everything is so accessible now due to uh, the widespread use That's good, yeah, and that's, I mean, that's kind of the, you're good. Um, that's kind of the premise of the movie Google Hunting from the, it's like the one of the first big ones that uh, Ben Affleck and Matt Damon did, right? Um, is that, that like, what can you do with a public, with a library card and $150, or $1.50 $100, $100 in library fees, right, for late books? 
um, it, that kind of deals with that. Um, what becomes the challenge now is we have these massive archival technologies, um, Google and, and other search engines and um, these databases that store all this information. The question is how do we know um, now it's not a question of do we have access to the information, but how, how do we know what information is trusted? How do we know, and so that's where this starts tying to that scientific aspect of writing where it's how can we trust the knowledge we get from the internet? We have to have a mechanism, we have to have a, a way of dealing with sources um, that helps us uh, discern when someone's just kind of spitballing on a blog versus when someone's uh, been, done personal research in this area or can link us to people who have. Yeah, that's a big, big point, yeah. Um, for like technical skills or technical abilities, uh, like I was thinking like binary. Um, to most people, binary just looks like ones and zeros, mm -hmm. but it's like its own unique language and people can read it just by looking at it, but if you don't have any knowledge or any idea of how it works, it's literally just gonna look like ones and zeros and nobody's gonna know what it is. Yeah. Unless you know what it is. Yeah, and so that good, and that ties back to um, that ties back to um, the when we talk about technical skill with languages too. So maybe that um, I can't remember who was saying it now. Um, maybe that's what Gina was saying. But when it ties back to how we deal with um, some of those softer forms of accessibility, um, where it's like, do I have the language to access this text? Was it Michael or Gina? I feel like it was over there somewhere. Um, so yeah, when we're dealing with, can I read the language? Do I know how to decode the language? Do I have the vocabulary? How do I go about dealing with this thing? Um, you know, whether that's a new college class, we taught, we discussed. It's not, you know, you may be struggling math or your science class or your history class or your sociology class, but you may not. It, some people will default to, I'm struggling because I'm just not a good student. But what it is is you're learning a new language, and that ties to this idea of like. You can't access the knowledge because you still have to develop that technical skill. You still have to develop that language um, to be able to engage with that technology, that writing system, or that content. Yeah. Um, yeah, Michael, it was you because you it was the content background, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, Alexi, and then we'll just we'll let you be the last one. Everybody else can sit down. Oh. When she's done. Okay. So. <clears throat> People who are deaf or mute, um, they can't vocalize. So they have to rely on sign language, but sign language is sort of like a niche language mm -hmm. that not a lot of people are familiar with. So, um, you know, text to word uh, apps on your phone um, gives them a way of being able to interact more readily with people that don't really know their language. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, thing is, not everybody has access to the funds to get something that would be able to do that for them. And so occasionally they have to carry around like pen and paper, but you know, it's still a valid way to you know, communicate with people. It just takes a bit longer for them to write out on them. And which dimension did you say that connected with? Physical and technical. Okay. And I'd also call it sociocultural if we're dealing with language, because it's how many people share your language, that form or that technology that you can access. So yeah, all of those things, good. Um, okay, everybody can sit down, good. Um, so, wow, you guys are amazing. That was some really good deep critical thought, good application. Um, uh, if anyone feels like going and brewing another pot, um, if it's empty, if it's empty, turn it off. If there still needs to be more coffee, someone's, you guys are welcome to go do that. Uh, just as a quick recap, or not recap, just to give a little bit. Um, so we discussed physical ability sometimes. Um, physical ability to use devices has led to kind of bouncing off our text-to-speech apps and that sort of thing. Um, physical ability to use uh, certain technologies um, has led to people developing uh, commu communication technologies that where you ask Siri, so you don't hands-free driving. That sort of, uh, those sort of writing technologies provide better accessibility with that. Um, uh, I want to say even, I want to say there are apps that even recognize certain hand signals or gestures. I know they've got face recognition, but I want to say like you can, that it reads body position, but I have to look that up. Um, when it comes FaceTime. to- FaceTime. FaceTime. Does FaceTime do that? FaceTime somebody. 
Yeah. 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 That's true. Okay, so you can just do video, yeah, yeah, yeah. just straight video conferencing. Yeah. Um, so physical ability to decode or engage in the system that um, does that. Um, I like your, you guys' physical accessibility. Like, if I don't have a car, that's so that's that could be economic, or it just could just mean cars don't exist. But I can't physically get where I need to go to use this technology. If I'm stranded on a desert island and I don't have a smartphone, it really doesn't matter that um, smartphones exist somewhere. I'm um, pretty sure YouTube also captions sign language. Cool. Now I'm wanting to look into it. Like this is a part of this I haven't dug into. Um, so as far as technical skills, you guys were right on track, and I usually use that example. We just want to be careful how we use that example. Uh, so is that you know? Has anyone ever had to help either? Has anyone ever had to help their mom, their dad, their grandma, their grandpa, their uh, younger brother or sister um, figure out technology like how to text or how to turn on a computer or how to do send an email? Raise your hand if you've ever. Okay. Uh, for those who aren't here, audio-wise, that's everyone in the class. Um, so that's because of a technical skill. Sometimes it's uh, small children that need training, and that's part of the reason why more computers are being incorporated into more classrooms in the K through 12 system. But sometimes it's um, it's just it's a new technology. Anytime you're learning anything new, it takes time to learn. Uh, that's a, the reason sometimes it's challenging as we get older is because we, um, even if it's like the difference between 20 years old versus 15 years old, we have more resources to draw back on. So sometimes we can default to why learn something new? Why learn a second language? Why dig into Spanish? What's, why dig into French? Why dig into some of these other languages? I've got plenty of English to get me by and function on an everyday basis. And that mentality tied, plays into not just linguistic technologies, but some of the other ones as well. Well, I know how to use a Palm Pilot. Why would I want to get a smartphone? I know how to use T9 texting, if you even know what that is. Um, <laughs> who here knows what that is? OK, so it's like the, you tap. So if you want to get to the number C, you tap three, like four times, that kind of thing. That's it. Welcome to my teenage years. Um, actually, no, I didn't even have a phone until I was like, until I got out of the house. I was 18, 19. That's still teenage. Um, but this idea, so we want to be careful when we approach new technologies. It's really easy to default and get grumpy about new things. Um, but uh, sometimes it's just a new system. Um, some people who have been raised with PCs all their lives jump on a Mac and it's weird. Things aren't where you're supposed to be. Vice versa, same thing's true. People used to finding um, things or certain shortcut keys don't know what to do when there's no command button. Um, so uh, you know you want to you want to be able you want to be adaptable, and we've been talking about that a little bit throughout the semester. So um, those are important physical ability, technical skills, or knowledge. Kind of making sure you have that so you can be more effective, be more versatile as writers and communicators. Um, the sociocultural access. You guys came up with some really great examples. Um, we can also talk, like, let's talk historically, or maybe, uh, maybe, maybe, what are some sociocultural access issues now? Um, like, who, who, when we talk, like, broad political scale, people who might struggle to have access um, to writing, to certain writing technologies. Poor class. What is it? A poor, poor yeah, class. so we meant poor class examples, or people who are lower income. Um, Right, it may be something to look at. Um, more broadly, what else? Beyond just money, what are the other dimensions that limit people's access socioculturally? Maybe like your religion? Maybe, okay, why would that limit? So talk me through that. Amish. Yeah. Amish. That's about Tag team. Tag team. Tag team. Tag team. Tag team. Check right now, let's see. That's a good one. Sorry, yes. Dolls have um, zero yeah. face. Zero face on balls. Okay. <laughs> I'm not, I think it's to uh, prevent vanity or something. Yeah. Okay. So Moving on. But yeah. Okay. But yeah. Okay. So uh, certain, and we'll say certain Amish groups, because um, some Amish groups do have businesses and do use the credit card swiper, and it's interesting. Um, what? Uh, all right. Other things. Got another one. I think like even other religions, like they don't want you reading certain books and stuff like that. Okay. So kind of so that religious apparatus, ideological apparatus, kind of saying, don't read this, don't read that, don't because you might. And they may have they may have um, based on their ideologies important reasons for limiting that, but it still is considered a sociocultural limitation on accessibility. Yeah. I think government limits or censors the thoughts of group books and social media and internet and all that. What? Mouse China? 
Um, what? Yeah, I, yeah. So that true. Um, I mean, that we do the. <laughs> I shouldn't have been immediate, so immediately. We do because in the U.S. we've had that too. Um, but uh, so we do uh, the band books thing here on campus regularly. Um, and admittedly, there are age ranges. Like there's stuff that I won't let my daughters read. I'm not gonna let my daughters watch the Netflix Marvel specials. They're pretty gritty, right? Them seeing Daredevil slice somebody or like punch somebody in the face 40 times, like that's intense. I don't think my eight-year-old needs to see that, right? Um, I don't even know if I need to see it. I kind of just deal with it because it's part of the larger story. Um, <laughs> but the, that sort of accessibility to text, yeah. Hashtag. Like I just saw a video from some guy in Syria who was like eating breakfast in the morning and there were just like guns going off everywhere and there were like bullets ricocheting off his house and stuff and like if you're trying to go to school and get an education, if you can even go to school during that time, then it's going to be really distracting. You're not going to be able to learn anything, maybe not even get routine. You might not even have a school. It might not even it might it not exist. It might have been bold. Um, so that ties to physical accessibility. The reason I can't get there is a political, socio-political conflict of some kind, military-oriented thing. I like, gotta dodge bullets to get to school. Probably not the coolest way to get there. Um, that's true in the U.S. as well, but the war's not the same kind of war, right? Um, again, neighborhoods I grew up in, sometimes that was an issue. Um, I remember, how, like, I was just telling somebody a story about a particular gang fight involved um, eight or ten gang members in two different gangs, and it was on my walk home. So we didn't walk that way that day, and we had to go like an extra half mile around. Um, thankfully, th in that case, I don't think there were any guns used. It was just kind of knives and bars and stuff. Anyways, um, but yeah, like that kind of stuff. Um, that that's n that's a thing. Um, okay, let's let's go. Let's take a way back machine, uh, Mr. Peabody. Um, <laughs> let's uh, let's. If we're talking uh, sociocultural accessibility in the 1950s, J Money. I don't know if this is the right time, but like maybe if you were a woman, you wouldn't be able to access as many things as a man. Maybe I'm too. You see, Callie's like throwing down on me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't so. Know if that's the right time for you, but. No, it, 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 it Talk us through it. Yeah, no, All right. So. Now you, so other, do you want to add? You said yes, yes it is? Oh, just because that was the time when women just used to be viewed as like the house maker. They'd like, you know, clean the house and their pure pearls. And yeah, early 40s, Rosie the Riveter. Early 50s, containment theory is what it's called in feminist studies. The idea that like the woman's role is in the home and that's where she belongs so that the men can have the jobs and do the work. Look at how wonderful she vacuums, that kind of thing. Like, and, and it's important. It is important to know that there's nothing wrong with being a housewife. There could be something wrong with the whole culture saying women should be housewives, right? Like my wife is a housewife and she's good at it and she likes it and she didn't do it because someone told her she had to. Um, she chose that. So um, we we talked through, we prayed about, it, we did, we figured all that out. Um, so there's nothing wrong with being a housewife, but when the dominant culture is saying every woman should be. Yeah. Um, but let's, but so that's yes. Um, let's also shift and make sure we're still focusing on writing or, or literacy and that sort of thing. Um, I mean, like, um, African Americans were really heavily imposed upon. They weren't allowed to go to like um, nice schools. They, their schools, if they, were, if they had any in their area, essentially got all the hand-me-downs from all the uh, other schools, all the like, white schools. Mm -hmm. um, so they got outdated information. They didn't have access to a lot of the things that their um, wild, white counterparts at the time had. Uh, they were, um, you know, they were discriminated against. Racism was a thing, so it was pretty. It was <laughs> racism pretty, was a thing. Racism, racism yeah. was yeah. and still yeah. is a thing, yeah. but it was extremely. Yeah, it's like you know, yeah. it's like people in the 1950s. They're like, why is George Washington Carver's book and name in my textbook? I'm no, pretty sure Jim Crow laws were still a thing. 